Hi, I'm Cam Franklin, a retired Coast Guard officer and SAMS accredited marine surveyor with over 40 years of experience in the maritime and diving industry. I've amassed literally thousands of photos of all the bad things I've found on boats during my career as a marine surveyor. So what we're going to do today is take a look at some of my favorites. We're going to take a look at each picture. We're going to discuss why they're evil. Evil! And we're going to discuss what you need to do to correct them. So hop in, buckle up, keep your arms and legs inside the car at all times as we take a carnival-like ride tour through the cavalcade of owner-induced perversions that I like to call Captain Frank's Sea Chest of Horror. Sea Chest of Horror. Here's proof that owners of outdriver stern drive vessels are caring, giving folks. If you take care of your stern drive and keep it protected by making sure your sacrificial anodes, aka zincs, are present and in proper working order, this is what your outdrive should look like. If, on the other hand, your marina neighbors have a grounding, bonding, or other such wiring issue, or there's a wiring issue on the dock itself, your aluminum drive will give of itself, acting like a huge sacrificial anode to protect your neighbors below the waterline metals. As aluminum is low on the galvanic corrosion noble metal pecking order, making it more susceptible, always ensure your stern drive sacrificial anodes are present and in good working order. And if you have a corrosion suppression system, uh, make sure that that's operational and working properly as well. Mousing or securing shackle screw pins with stainless steel wire to keep them from unscrewing is always recommended. However, it needs to be done correctly. Contrary to this photo, the mousing wire should pass through the pin and around the shackle itself, not around a chain as shown here. Uh, if you mouse the shackle as it's shown here, uh, it can work due to movement of the chain and likely will cause the wire to break. If your anchor road utilizes a shackle to connect chain to anchor, an anchor shackle should always be used. Anchor shackles are C-shaped to reduce binding and provide greater freedom of movement, as opposed to chain shackles, which are more U-shaped. What should not be used is a quick connect link. Quick connect links are designed to join chain, although even then they should be considered a temporary measure at best. They're weaker than a connecting link, which is the proper way to connect shot to chain, and they can bind or jump off of when passing through a windlass or wildcat due to their larger size. They're also weaker than a properly sized anchor shackle. They offer less freedom of movement and they're prone to seizing due to corrosion and or thread distortion. The LPG system installation here, and I do use the word installation uh, loosely, uh, fails to meet uh, many industry standards and recommendations regarding LPG system installations. The two we're going to address with regards to this photo would be an improperly secured uh, propane tank or storage tank and lack of a pressure gauge. Propane tanks must be installed in a dedicated propane locker that is vapor proof to the vessel's interior and vents overboard or be located on the vessel's exterior so that escaping gases can flow directly overboard. The other requirement is the LPG gauge, which allows you to conduct a leak down test to verify there are no leaks in the system. That's the purpose of the gauge in your propane system. It's not there to tell you how much fuel you have, although it will do that, but the main purpose of that gauge is to allow you to conduct a leak down test. Leak down tests are a simple, easy way to check the health of your LPG system and should be done on a regular basis. Uh, to conduct a leak down test, turn on the tank valve and energize the remote solenoid switch if your LPG system has one installed. This pressurizes the system from the tank to the stove. Note the pressure gauge reading and then close the tank valve, leaving the solenoid switch open or in the on position. The gauge reading should remain constant for at least three minutes. If the pressure drops, then you have a leak or leaks which must be found and corrected prior to using the system. Use leak detection fluid or a solution of dishwashing soap and water to find the leaks. You'll typically find them at fittings and connections, although they can occur anywhere in the system due to chafe or physical damage to supply lines or other system components. Do not use solutions containing ammonia, uh, which can attack brass fittings.
And unless you want top billing at the Darwin Awards website, never use a flame to check for leaks. This is the type of wiring layout that a technician hopes to see when they step on board a boat to do some troubleshooting. Sadly, the grim reality is they're more likely to see something like this, or even this one here. Can you feel the frustration of the poor technician tasked with troubleshooting an electrical problem in this mess? The only thing worse than dealing with an electrical issue is having to wade through a jumble of loose, unorganized wiring before even beginning the troubleshooting process. Unsupported wires and cables can bounce around while underway, causing plenty of electrical issues, ranging from broken connectors or wires to gremlin-like intermittent problems that seem to magically appear and disappear with no rhyme or reason. Let's take a look at just some of the few problems easily visible in this rat's nest of wiring. First up, the venerable rusty corroded alligator clamp. You know whatever's getting its power from this thing has a slew of intermittent issues and operational problems. Or what about this loose power connection? You know this baby is arcing and sparking every time the boat hits a wave. And let's don't forget the potential excitement that can be caused by these two exposed, energized uh, conductors as they bounce around the boat uh, looking for something to short. The builder of this vessel has added bits of scrap iron, steel, probably anything else he could get his hands on to add weight to the poured concrete ballast. Concrete is not very heavy, particularly as compared to lead. Uh, once water seeps into the, to the concrete area or the ballast uh, from the bilge or possibly via the hull damage, the metal scraps begin to rust and expand, causing the fiberglass uh, of the hull to crack and rupture. The voids in the concrete indicate where the metal scraps are located. Want to start an argument in most any boat yard? Find a boat where the shaft nuts are in this configuration, thick nut first, thin nut last, and tell the owner or yard manager who installed it that they're backwards. It seems like a no-brainer that the larger nut against the prop would do most of the work, and then the smaller nut should just go on second to kind of hold it in place. In reality, however, it's the smaller nut that should always go against the load because it is the jammed nut, not the jam nut. That's because when the second outer nut is tightened down, it compresses and deforms the inner nut a tiny bit, rotating it a fraction of a turn. This effectively unloads the threads of the first nut and engages the threads of the second nut. Thus, the top or outer nut actually takes all the load. As the larger nut has more thread area and thus more holding power, it's the one you want as the outer nut. I see prop nuts installed backward like this all the time. Is it a critical error? No, because if it was, half the boats in the world wouldn't have props on them. Uh, however, it is technically inaccurate. So if you do pull your prop off, uh, then why not just put it on the right way? I used to get in arguments with uh, brokers and yard guys all the time on this. Well, we've been doing it this way for 40 years. Well, you know what, buddy? You've been doing it wrong for 40 years. However, now I've mellowed out my old age, so I just uh, make a note of it and write it in my reports. We're going to take a look at two good examples that show the problems associated with the deck level use of swaged fittings. Swedging or swadging is a process where tubular stainless steel fittings are essentially crimped onto uh, rigging wire under high pressure. Uh, it's not to be confused with crimping, but the process is, is, is similar. Salt water and other such corrosive elements run down the wire and migrate into the fitting, initiating rust, which in turn expands and eventually causes the swedge to rupture and the wire to pull free unexpectedly. This is beautifully illustrated by the uh, swedged fitting here, which has a vertical crack in it. The mechanical fitting uh, shown to the left of the swedge fitting is a much better way to go for uh, deck level fittings. Um, these mechanical fittings, they could be stay locks, uh, Norseman, whatever they are, uh, they mechanically grip the wire using a conical wedge inserted into the center of the wire and fitting bar that covers it. They also have the additional advantage of uh, being reusable. While vertical cracks and swage fittings are bad enough, horizontal cracks are even worse and indicate the need for immediate corrective action. 
Unlike vertical cracks, which are typically caused by uh, internal corrosion, horizontal cracks are generally caused by metal fatigue. Uh, such fittings have no safety margin for error, meaning they can fail at any moment and must be replaced before uh, placing the vessel in the service. Uh, if you see either of these uh, issues, you should also inspect the rest of the vessel standing and rigging, as it's very likely the same age and prone to similar failure. So here's a good reason why you should always check your fire extinguishers at least monthly. Um, mud daubers, spiders, other kind of critters, they like to build nests and homes inside the nozzle. Uh, this one, it doesn't look too bad from this angle, but it was actually a couple of chambers uh, thick and the end was uh, pretty much solidly capped off. This photo is after I dug into it a little bit and was breaking it out before I, you know, I remembered, hey, you know what, I should probably take a picture of this. Cabin leaks are never a good thing, and this one is no exception. Uh, the boat owner stated that brown fluid oozed out of the cabin roof at infrequent intervals, sometimes after a good rain, other times after the boat was healed while sailing. Uh, an investigation revealed the coach roof and cabin side coring uh, showed extremely high moisture readings. Uh, water likely entered the uh, coring due to uh, caulking failure and leaking of the mounting uh, hardware for a sail track. This brownish liquid is a common uh, symptom of moisture entry into the coring of a deck or coach roof. And it is uh, an indication that there's uh, the coring is deteriorating and uh, rotting due to uh, the moisture entry. The brownish liquid itself is known as trawler juice uh, in reference to the uh, Taiwanese built trawlers from the 70s and 80s that had teak decks that were fastened to the uh, fiberglass decks with using about a million screws. Uh, these screws uh, allowed numerous uh, points of possible entry for moisture into the deck coring once the caulking failed for the teak decks. Interior leaks uh, can also be caused by a number of other issues such as uh, mounting hardware for deck mounted fixtures uh, leaking uh, again due to failed caulking. Another source of interior leaks would be from uh, portholes, port lights, windows, again due to uh, failed caulking. In these cases, the uh, fixtures need to be pulled and rebedded or recaulked. The potential problems caused by any joint formed by clamping a larger size hose on a smaller one are obvious, but it's particularly bad when done in the exhaust system. Not only does it create a potential source of uh, carbon monoxide leakage into the interior, but failure here also means that the engine would be pumping uh, exhaust water directly into the vessel. When I was a kid, there was a uh, TV commercial for an oil change franchise that featured a chimpanzee uh, changing people's oil. He would change their oil and drain it and change the oil filter. And the big tagline was, uh, you know, pay me now or pay me later, you know, indicating that if you didn't pay him now to change the uh, oil, then you'd be paying the, that monkey to change your engine out later on. Looking at this uh, engine exhaust uh, riser, uh, we can tell that, you know what, it's later. Uh, the run and rust here is indicative of corrosion. Um, and if it's this bad on the outside, then you can imagine that it is uh, 10 times worse on the inside. Exhaust risers, uh, also known as exhaust elbow, should be periodically removed, pressure tested, and checked for internal corrosion or clogging, as failure here could easily result in catastrophic engine failure as a result of water leaking back down into the engine cylinders. Small boats and big engines often equate to major headaches from both a survey and upkeep standpoint. Uh, the more of a pain it is to do maintenance, the greater chance it won't get done. These twin 454 Crusaders were shoehorned in so tight that an average sized person could barely stand sideways between them. Much less uh, access components to conduct preventive maintenance or repairs, it's almost impossible to physically access the space or equipment located forward and outboard of the engines. The owner commented that when he had to replace the battery charger, which was located on the bulkhead forward of the starboard engine, uh, <clears throat> he hired a seven-year-old boy to squeeze into the space and unscrew the mounting bolts and install the new unit. 
This is one of two cutlass bearings from a twin engine power boat uh, that were so severely worn that both shafts uh, were damaged and had to be replaced. A uh, cutlass bearing is a short metal tube, usually brass, with an inner grooved rubber lining. The bearing holds the shaft steady as it turns, while the grooves, which run fore and aft, allow water to enter the cutlass bearing and provide lubrication to the shaft as it turns. Uh, cutlass bearing replacement is a routine maintenance item. They all eventually wear to the point of looseness, at which point, if they're left unaddressed, it can result in a number of problems, from excessive shaft vibration to drivetrain alignment issues. Uh, in cases of severe wear, uh, such as the photo shown above, the groove channels are completely worn away, meaning the shaft receives no lubrication from the surrounding water, leading to scoring of the shaft due to friction and a reduction in diameter where it passes through the cutlass bearings. The seller had replaced both cutlass bearings the day before the survey, but even with new cutlass bearings of the proper size installed, both shafts still had significant play. Uh, after the survey, the shafts were removed, and it was discovered that the diameter of each shaft had decreased by almost one-eighth of an inch where they transitioned the cutlass bearings. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the drain for an LPG storage locker. This is where your tank is stored. At the bottom of your propane locker, it's got to have a vent that goes directly overboard. The problem with this installation is it has a, a shower sump uh, drain pump teed into the hose so that it can utilize the same through hole for an overboard discharge. Uh, per ABYC recommendations, that's American Boat and Yacht Council, the vent has to uh, be a dedicated vent, meaning that it can't have any tees or breaks in the hose coming from the bottom of the propane locker directly overboard. The reason for this, of course, is that if there was a, uh, a leak in the propane locker, a uh, tank failed or hose ruptured or whatever, then the escaping propane should flow directly overboard. The problem with this installation is that uh, escaping propane rather than flowing overboard it could flow back into the uh, the hose go into the shower sump pump and flow back into the vessel's interior. Now you've got a bilge filled with uh, propane that could be ignited from a spark from a bilge pump starting or anything along those lines. So what we have here is a seacock installation that employs uh, two short sections of piping and a 90 degree elbow between the seacock and the through hull. Problem is, is that this introduces a possible point of failure uh, that is not protected by the seacock. In other words, if the piping fails or it cracks off, uh, then you have no seacock there to prevent water from entering the vessel. The seacock should be mounted directly to the through hull. Uh, that way you have no additional points of failure uh, that are not protected by the seacock. Uh, this photo here shows another example of it. Uh, you've got the through hole coming up to a T and then it splits off and now you've got two seacocks but neither one of them could prevent water from entering the vessel if, uh, for example, the T fitting failed at the through hole. Arm uh, type or flapper type bilge pump float switches must be securely mounted and installed clear of wires, hoses, and other obstructions that can impede operation of the floating arm, or a flapper switch as it's called. Uh, they should also be oriented with the switch aligned fore and aft and the flapper pointed toward the stern. This is especially important on power boats. During jackrabbit takeoffs, surging bilge water can damage the flapper mechanism, even ripping it apart in some cases as shown here. Installing them close to a bulkhead or frame also helps protect the switch from the torrent of water. Uh, enclosed switches eliminate this worry, but can also be more difficult to inspect and test. So the owner of this vessel needed AC power on board, but he didn't want to fuss with any of those frilly add-ons like plugs, breaker panels, and permanent wiring. His solution was to simply take a 30 to 15 amp adapter, cut the end from the three-plug extension cord, then tape the wires to the prongs at the 15 amp adapter end. No need for that fancy electrical grade tape either. Uh, while quick and easy, this approach pretty much defies any standard or recommendation uh, regarding AC shore power installations known to man. It goes without saying, but here we go. Uh, this type of MacGyverism, when you're talking about AC shore power, uh, can result in anything from shock hazards, fire, death, 
pretty much all the bad things an improperly installed AC power system can bring to the table. 